it is my great pleasure to welcome Re- Reba McIntyre to the show. How are you? I am doing great. How you doing? Thank you for asking. You know, I'm doing a lot better now that I'm talking to you. I tell you that much. Why, <laughs> of all your records, why this one? Why is this one you wanted to re-release? What does it mean to you? 1990 was a very special year for me. I had my son, Shelby, in February of 1990, and then went right into recording an album with Tony Brown. He was That's the first time I'd gotten to go in the studio with him. Before Tony, my producer, was Jimmy Bowen, who had produced everyone from George Strait to Frank Sinatra. And we were having uh, a great success, but wanted to go just change up a little bit. So I went with Tony Brown and... Tony and I had a blast in the studio. We'd worked together several years before at MCA Records. Um, We went after recording that into a full-blown tour called the Rumor Has It Tour. So 1990 was a really special year for me. I totally enjoyed the tour, the album, great songs. Kudos to the songwriters who did a wonderful job on all the songs. And it was an album that we could have had at least 10 singles from it if we didn't have to keep on recording, putting out new albums. It was just that kind of an album. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the songs and maybe we can sort of relive that time through them. Take a listen to this. You lie You don't want to hurt me So you lie Yeah, what a note. That is Reba <laughs> McIntyre and You Lie from the 1990 album Rumor Has It. What do you? Where does that put you when you hear that now? Oh, it takes me back into the studio, and it was about the second or third song we recorded that day, thank God, because of the range of that song. That's not one that you can uh, put in the middle of, uh, at the beginning of a show. If you're not warmed up, don't try that song. Yeah, I saw both it, of it our was, eyebrows go up at that high note there, you know? Yeah, yeah it's really <laughs> high, real rangy, broad range. But man, what a great song when I'm singing it. Even before we shot the video, I had in my mind's eye my little video that runs for me every time I sing it. And then we got to do a video with, um, where I'm with horses. And uh, it was just so much fun. It was a black and white video, which I absolutely love those. So You Lie is a song that it will always be one of my favorites. What I find really interesting about you is you're an, a very great songwriter. You also uh, record songs by by other people. And I don't think that's as rare as people make it out to be. I mean, people people love songs and, and people uh, sing songs that they love. But I'm always very curious about this when it comes to someone who both writes songs and appreciates them. What does it need to have? What are you looking for? Because I, I can't, I, I have to imagine it's more than just I like it. What does a song need to have for you to want to sing it? Mm, lots of density. It has to have great lyrics, great melody, but more importantly, I don't need to get bored with it when I continue to listen and listen and listen, trying to find the right song to record. I write a few songs, but mainly I go out. I go out to uh, friends, my publishing buddies. uh, We just send a list out or a note out saying when I'm going to record and looking for songs now. And I have so many people helping me find songs, a great team of people who are knowledgeable and and uh help me tremendously i pray before i go in to listen and um look for songs that maybe there's a song that i need to sing that somebody needs a little help with whether it's a laugh a smile or heal their heart music is very very strong and healing so you just don't sing a song to be singing a song a song has a purpose and it always finds its home you kind of know it you kind of know it when you first hear it well, if enough that if it's not the first time I hear it, something's in that song that makes me go back to it, and I keep listening and keep listening, and I can't wait to sing it. Let's take a listen to the title track. I'm Tom Parry, you're listening to Q. I'm talking to country legend Reba McIntyre. That song you're hearing, Reba Has It, from the album of the same name. That album turns 30 this year, and to celebrate, Reba is reissuing that album. And she's here with me right now. I love when you talk uh, about this, because I always think that... I always talk to people, you know, Reba, who... It doesn't happen for them right away, and they get discouraged, and they might give up. 
And I love I love stories that, like yours that you know it takes some time, but when it does happen, it's incredible. And you know you were you were long into your career and you had a lot of success by then by 1990. But that really kind of broke you into the mainstream. So, but what do you think time? What do you think time gives you, as opposed to just it all happening right away? Time gives me more experience, more practice, more time to get schooled and taught. I had lots of great teachers from producers, record labels, managers, friends to help and groom and school me. Because when I started in the music business in the middle 70s, I, I had no idea about the professional part of the music business. I had been singing with Pake and Susie, my brother and sister, since we were little bitty kids. And then we had uh, the singing McIntyres and we were playing clubs when we were 13, when I was 13 years old. And we had a little band there at Kiowa, Oklahoma, where I went to school for 12 years. But it's nothing like going to Nashville and being thrown in the deep end of the swimming pool where you're the you're not even a minute. You're just you're a little bitty fish in, in the ocean and absolutely had no idea. I thought that when you had a number one record, you had a bus immediately and you're rich. Mm. Didn't happen that way. No, uh, it took me from 1976 to 83 to even have a number one record. And thank God the folks at Polygram Mercury Records didn't drop me. They kept me. They schooled me. They groomed me. And I just loved every baby step that I got to take. But you're one of the most persistent artists I know. Like, it, it doesn't surprise me that you didn't give up when it didn't happen right away. Well, I was taught in Oklahoma, you don't give up. If you want something bad enough, you fight for it, and you really hang in there and give it up your all. And just so long as I was progressing, I was okay. I never had a real bad step back, but they were baby steps. It wasn't anything large. People will ask me, what was, the, what was your big break? Well, um, I guess singing the national anthem at the National Finals Rodeo in Oklahoma City in 1974. I sang the national anthem. Everybody was paying attention. A gentleman by the name of Red Stegall heard me and told Mama to bring me down to Nashville the next January. He'd, we'd do a demonstration tape on me. And they pitched it around town. Nobody was interested. And then Glenn Keener at Polygram Mercury Records heard the demo tape. He said, well... I'm not interested in the songs, but who's the girl singer? Mm. So you never know. People will ask me, how do you get in the business? And I said, well, if you really want to be in this business, you better be careful what you wish for, because it's a lot of hard work and it's commitment. And if you get into it and you don't give it all your heart and soul, just think you might have knocked somebody else out of an opportunity to have your position that you're having right now. So work hard. Give it your best. Show up, be on time and Hopefully it'll work out for you. I, I'm very grateful and thankful of what I've gotten to do over the last 45 years. But there's no short of obstacles you had to face in order to do that. And I read an essay you wrote for People Magazine a few years back, and you wrote, there are all kinds of challenges that come from being a woman in a man's world, but I don't let them keep me down. What's, what's the biggest lesson you learned in that respect? Basically that you don't give up. Men and women are different. They're not supposed to be the same. So... Instead of bitching and griping about not getting this or not getting that or not getting equal pay, you work harder. You go in with a smile and you find better songs. You work better. You do a bigger show. You just do what you can on your side, being a female, a girl singer in a man's world, a man's industry. Um, but see, I was used to that. I grew up in, in overworking cattle ranch. Um, us girls worked on the pens. We worked down uh, working cattle, gathering cattle. And then when uh, lunchtime came, we called it dinner. We went up and we cooked with mama and we cleaned up and then we went back to the pens. So it was, we did double duty. So I was used to that. So when I got in the music business and also in the rodeo business, um, when I got in the music business, I knew we're still in a man's world and you just suck it up and go for it. Have you seen... You, have you seen growth since then? I mean, there's been such incredible strides oh, yeah. towards equality. There's been, you know, we're not, we're not exactly where we need to be, of course, but, you know, things have really changed since then. Sure they have, for the better. And it's been a lot, it's a lot better than when Loretta Lynn was getting started or Tammy Wynette or Dolly or um, the list goes on and on. It's getting better. But still the same thing, and I don't care if you're a man or a woman, what you've got to find is that great song. 
it all starts with the music. If you don't have a great song, you can be the greatest singer in the world and it not connect. And then once you have that song, you've got to get in there and work to promote it. It's going to be a great song, but it's going to be a better song if a lot of people know about it and you promote it. So it's a lot of work, not only after finding the song and recording it, you've got to get it out there to the mass audience to let them know what's going on. Let's talk about that song. Take a listen to this. Well, mama washed and combed and curled my hair and she painted my eyes and lips. And then I stepped into a satin dancing dress I had a split from the side clean up to my heel. It was red velvet trimming and it fit me good. And standing back from the looking glass there stood a woman more a half-grown kid it stood. <laughs> that is... Reba McIntyre and Fancy, originally written and recorded by Bobby Gentry. Um, Reba McIntyre joins me now. The 30th anniversary re-release, Rumor Has It, is out everywhere now. I love, by the way, I can, I can, I can, it's in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times you've sang that song, and I love that we were playing it for you, and you were still dancing to it, you were still smiling when you heard it. I love it. It's a sassy, rags-to-riches song. I loved it when Bobby Gentry had it out in 1968. And like I was telling you earlier, I used to, we were in clubs performing dance halls when we were, you know, junior high, high school. And when it was my turn to do a solo, my part, you know, Pay could sing a song and Susie and I would sing harmony and then we'd swap. When it was my turn, I'd sing fancy and they'd go, we can't dance to that. And I'd say, well, sit down and shut up because I'm going to be singing it. We'll get you a drink. <laughs> but I love that song. I love story songs. That's why I'm always a huge fan of Tom T. Hall. Dolly Parton, anybody who's got great story songs, I absolutely love them. Bobby Gentry, bit of a mysterious figure, right? Yeah, I've never met her, never heard from her. Um, Fancy's my biggest song. I guess it's hers, maybe Ode to Billy Joe. Yeah, great story but, song there, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely, a mystery song. I, have, I, I still don't know. I still don't know what happened person. at the end of that song. I don't know if anybody does. But anyway, you never, you never heard from her? Idea. I mean, that's, that's a, that was you getting that big hit with that song did a lot for her too. You never, you never came across her. Never. Uh -uh. Now I've, I've met people who know her and I will ask a lot of questions and that if she wants to, you know, be left alone, I sure respect her for that. I hear it was a bit hard to get fancy recorded for yourself. I heard it was a bit of a fight to, to get that on the record. Well, as I said, Jimmy Bowen was my producer before Tony Brown. And I had said something about, what do you think about us doing uh, fancy? Do a remake on that. He said, "Old oh, woman, you don't need to do that. You don't need to sing that kind of song. You know, being a prostitute and all. So, wow. So anyway, when I got with Tony Brown, I said, uh, Tony asked me, he said, you know, well, there's any remakes you'd like to do, record? I said, fancy. He goes, oh, my gosh, that's my favorite song. I said, oh, great, let's do it. <laughs> and we had a blast getting to do fancy. I even performed it on the – um, CMA Awards, ACMs, and just had the best time performing it. What did you like about it? It's a pretty radical song. What did you like about it? It's acting. When I'm when you're singing, you're acting because the video in your mind is going, and you're fancy, and you can't help but being transformed, and you stand a little higher, and you kick your hip out just a little bit more, and get that eyebrow going, and a little bit of attitude. And what's so fun on this album, we've done a remix, uh, a dance mix, and then an acoustic version of Fancy. So you've got the one we released 30 years ago, and then you've got one that's souped up dance mix, and the video to that, they've done such a great job on it. I just love it. It's got all the different outfits, costumes, everything together, uh, meshed into one video. And then we've got the acoustic version that we did at the Ryman Auditorium. I'm not surprised that it's... Um... I'm not surprised that it's, it's being re-released. I'm not surprised that there's so many different versions of it because... It feels like Fancy has, hasn't been this popular in 30 years. I mean, you close out your shows with it. It's an anthem for drag queens. Uh, the great Canadian country singer Orville Peck did a, just did a cover of it. Esquire called it the Song of Summer 2020. It's having a bit of a moment. Any idea why it's resonating now? Well, I kind of felt it resonated all the time because people just love to hear it. Um, I did hear, hear Orville Peck's uh, version of it. Matter of fact, I was just listening to it today. It's great. I liked it a lot, but it's just a great song. Everybody loves fancy. But it's, 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 it's a powerful song in a lot of ways. And, you know, when I think about your repertoire, I think about the stairs, you know, as, mm. about an abusive relationship. I think she thinks his name was John about a woman living with AIDS. We just spoke a little bit about fancy. And as much as it is acting and as much as it is being part of a music video, 
do you do you feel a responsibility to say something with your music? Sure, I always have. When I went to the publishing companies in the ninety, uh, just to listen to songs, I would go from publishing company to publishing company, and I say, "Please play me the songs that you think I would record that I would like." And I was walking out of a publishing company, and they said, "One guy said to the other, said, did you play it for?'" Her? And they said, "No, I didn't." I said, "What?" Well. I think you're the only person that would record this. And I said, okay, I got to hear it. And it was, she thinks his name was John about AIDS. Well, I didn't know anybody who had AIDS, but I recorded it because I thought that if I could sing about it, people who are infected with AIDS or know somebody, maybe they can talk about it. And I've always believed that if you bring a bad situation out into the light, it's not as scary or as bad as you think it is. Of course, AIDS was horrible. Um, but it did bring light and help people to talk about it more. So that was the main reason I recorded that song. I, I feel like that doesn't get talked about enough. Maybe that's just me, you know. I think that, you know, when I when I look at those songs and I look at, you know, you posted the Black Square for Blackout Tuesday, you know, I frankly, as a country music, a big country music fan like I am, I have seen a, a tremendous response. I've seen, you know, the Opry made a statement around Black Lives Matter. Uh, of course, the Chicks changed their name. Um, I saw I saw folks like Luke Combs, who are big country stars, posting Black Squares as well. It does it does feel like something's happening in country music right now, or, or maybe it's just always been there. Country music, music has always had a big heart, full of compassion. It's It's never changed, in my opinion. In my, for speaking for myself, I treat people the way I want to be treated. So if there's anybody treat, being treated wrong, um, that's that's not right. It's just the golden rule. and We just all need to follow that. Be kind to others. Treat people like you want to be treated. And if and if there's a problem, let's talk about it. Let's this this cancel culture stuff. There you can't learn from just saying mm, when is up. I'm I'm over. That's all we're going to talk about. I'm right. You're wrong. That's it. End of discussion. No, we don't learn anything that way. Give the person the benefit of a doubt. And let's discuss it. Yeah, you're right. When I when I, when the Opry posted up that Instagram post, there was a lot of well, that's it. I'm done with the Opry. That's it. I'm never going to listen to the Opry again. And I thought to myself, well, what, what are you? You're missing out on so much by doing that. They're lost. They're lost. Everybody can get along if you just put an effort out. Maybe sometimes we need to listen more than we talk. I can I can tell just by talking to you how much I I'm, I live in the big city. I live in Toronto, and I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Newfoundland. I'm from a more rural place. I love that. Yeah, and I can tell talking to you. I can tell the lessons that you learned in Oklahoma that have that have stuck with you. You know what I mean? I can tell that. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, we we're neighborly people in Oklahoma. You you help out. Um, it was just the way things was back then and still today. You're very neighborly. You treat people like you want to be treated and help out your neighbor. A person that's down on their luck, you help them out. So how's, have you been able to get back during the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, I was there during the start of COVID. Um, uh, my mama passed away. I was there with her for a couple of weeks. Then oh, I'm so sorry. I came home. Thank you very much. She was 93 years old, had a wonderful life. What was her name? Was ready to go see the Lord. Jacqueline Undine Smith McIntyre. God love her. So, yeah, I was there and then I came back to Nashville to get ready for the new tour. Uh, we were in rehearsals and Susie, my little sister, called me on the 15th and said, she's gone. She 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 passed. And I said, wonderful, because we've been praying for her to go on to see daddy and her mom and dad and brother and sister. And and uh, she was hurting really bad. And so I stayed uh, to help Alice Pake and Susie. Um clean the house out and she'd been living there for a long time. So it took us a good three weeks and I stayed until after mother's day. And, um, I wanted to stay with my family for mother's day. And then I, the day after I came back. So I was on the ranch there in Chalky, Oklahoma and, and, um, stayed with my family and absolutely loved it. My heart goes out to the folks who have been affected by the COVID-19, um, people they have lost friends, loved ones. Um, but I've got to say, this has been the best break for me I've had in my career, probably my lifetime. Yeah, you're not one. To, you're to, not one to stop working, Reba. You know, you're not one for it. Well, I, I, I haven't stopped working. You know, with the album and the uh, we're doing a podcast, and 
Um, not, I, I just, I did one show, one concert this year. It was March the 1st and then it, it all hit. We still haven't given the memorial uh, service for mama. We did bury her, but uh, we didn't want to do anything half-assed, as we say, in, <laughs> at home in Oklahoma. She needed a big send-off, and, and she was a show dog. She needed that. So we're, we're going <laughs> to wait until everybody can gather up again. Then we're going to give her the send-off she deserves. Are you, are you Reba back home? Or are you, are you, I mean, are you, able, are you Reba McIntyre back home, or are you, are, are you just Reba from down the road? I'm <laughs> just down the road. <laughs> they, uh, it's, it's really neat to go back and to see everybody. Uh, I've, all my family's there. A few of them here in Nashville, but mo- the majority's in, in Oklahoma. It's good to go back and see my friends and family. Uh, we're going to close things off like this. I, I, so many big songs and, and big singles off this record, but I also know that on every record, there's a song that the artist which has got a little bit more attention, a little bit love, maybe a little bit more radio play, more people knew about it. Is there a song on Rumor Has It like that for you? If we were to go out on a song and you got to choose it, what would it be? You Remember Me. I thought that's such a great song. It still is. But You Remember Me is just a little bit of a, hey, I'm back. Remember me? You might be a little high on the totem pole or big for your britches, but... I remember you when. I, I just love that song. First time I heard it, I fell in love with it. Well, how could we forget you, Reba McIntyre? Thank you so much Aww. for your time today. I love talking to you. <laughs> Thank you. Good visiting with you too.